year 2000, I'll bet you don't find anything in that catalog that you'd want today because the stuff you buy today is so much better. Think about the cars. Those of you who are my age, uh, I see maybe one, uh, think of the cars that you rode in as a kid. You know, no power windows, no power door locks, no power steering, no power brakes. You didn't have air conditioning, and most likely it was a clutch. Now you get into a leather seat with lumbar support, and if your fanny gets cold, you know, you just turn on the seat heaters. Well, how did we get here? We got here because of capitalism. We got here because of incentives. We got here because of inventors and entrepreneurs had an idea and were willing to risk it all to get there. And over that hundred years of change, we went through two catastrophic world wars, a disastrous depression, another war kind of in the middle. And yet through all that, our living standards continued to grow. You know, Capitalism is prone to booms and busts, and there may be something to the idea that maybe it had a little bit to do with the financial crisis. But you know, as uh, Winston Churchill said about democracy, it's the worst way to organize a government there is, well, except for all the others. How about the idea that America is no longer a leading economic power? That's another uh, myth I want to... Uh, uh, try to dispel. The end of 2008, and for all of 2008, the U.S. economy, the output of our entire economy, 24.9 percent of global output, that's a fourth. We have bonds issued by U.S. companies are 40 percent of global world bonds. Equities issued by U.S. corporations, 42 percent of global equity market capitalization. That means the U.S. is home to 40 to 45 percent of all the liquid financial stocks in the United, uh, or in the entire world, stocks and bonds. The output of California, the California gross domestic product, the entire production, it's the same size as Italy. The output of Texas is the same size as Canada. You take Iowa and the five states that border us, it's the same size as Russia. U.S. household net worth, 50-some trillion dollars. We could buy, with that net worth, the annual output of every single country in the entire world. U.S. consumer spending alone in 2009, even though that was down below what it was the year before, could have bought all of the output of China plus Japan, the second and third largest economies. From the five years from 2002 to 2007, just the growth the increase in the U.S. production was greater than the output of China. Well, now, I'm not trying to, you know, toot our horn here, say the U.S. is wonderful and nothing else means anything. I'm just trying to put some of the depressed attitudes that people have today in a kind of perspective. Well, how about that well-worn belief that, you know, we don't make anything, U.S. manufacturing is dead in the water and we're not going anywhere? Well, the fact is that U.S. manufactures more goods than any other country in the world and by a long ways. In 2007, we were 20% of global manufactured products. That's a fifth. Where was China? 12%, less than an eighth. In 2007, U.S. factories and workers produced <clears throat> 5,250 complete aircraft, 81 million metric tons of raw steel, 10.7 million motor vehicles, 25.6 million computers, 11.6 million refrigerators, the same number of washing machines, 7 million water heaters, 1.4 million clothes dryers, 1.6 billion yards of carpet and rugs, enough to cover 6 million average size houses wall to wall. We also produce 12 million short tons of chlorine gas, 9 million tons of sodium hydroxide, 5 million tons of hydrochloric acid, 1.5 billion gallons of paint and associated products, $123 billion of pharmaceutical preparations, not counting medicine, and we also produced a, or manufactured a good share of the 3.13 billion books that were sold here in the United States in 2007. Manufacturing is a smaller part of the U.S. It's 12 percent today, it was 30 percent or so in the 1950s. Why? Because we consume fewer goods and more services. The richer we get, the more affluent we become, the more services that we choose. 
As our income goes up, we choose to spend money on doctors and dentists and lawyers and accountants and medical professionals and housing and recreation and education and research and domestic and foreign air travel and personal finance and less on food and clothing. In 1950, we spent two-thirds of our income on goods, the rest on services. Today, it's 60-40, but the 60 is services. Manufacturing is smaller because we prefer tanning salons, vacation, travel, golf, and eating out. Well, I've tried to make two points here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. One, well, let's take stock of that. That sounds pretty good to me, right? I've tried to dispel some of these myths. So what I've tried to do is maybe make a couple of points. One, that the U.S. is really a terrific country. We have the highest standard of living. We've been extremely successful, and we think we will continue. I mean, in what country in the world do 43% of the people underneath the poverty line own their own house? In what country do 80% of the people underneath the, popu the, the poverty line have air conditioning? 73% own their own car, 31% own two or more cars, 97% of those underneath the poverty line have a color TV. In what country do people buy two or three steps that are carpeted so Fido doesn't have to jump up on the couch but can walk up and so his little paws don't get hurt when he jumps? No other company, country. You know, we were the first into Haiti and we had the most and that's true of every, uh, of every disaster. The pessimists that compare us to the rise and fall of the Roman Empire should remember that uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire continued for 800 years, and the Byzantine part of the Roman Empire lasted for two millennia. I guess the second point I want to make is that we need to remember where we came from. You know, the federal government didn't do this. The state governments didn't do it. What gave us our affluence, our productivity, our standard of living, and our lifestyles today? was an inventor, an inventor with an idea, a financier who was willing to finance that new idea, and a capitalist who thought he could make some money by taking that idea, capitalizing on that, and turning it into something that consumers might want. All of those people did all of those things because they wanted to get rich. They didn't do it because somebody told them. It was Robert Fulton and his steam engine. It was the Orville and Wilbur Wright at Kitty Hawk. It was Henry Ford in the, who made the first assembly line. It was uh, Edwin Land and his uh, camera. It was Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and their PCs. It was Bandag here that learned how to replace or uh, uh, redo uh, tires. It was George Washington Carver and his peanuts. The wealth of a country is not determined by its pile of currency reserves as in China nor is the wealth of a country determined by the billions of barrels underneath the sand in the Middle East. The wealth of a country is its ability to generate ideas, to create technology, to foster innovation, to recognize and foster the good ideas and have those other kinds of ideas find bankruptcy as soon as possible. So I worry, I guess, that maybe the biggest risk to all of this that we have today are some of the things that are going on in Washington. You might call some of them job prevention programs. Huge new taxes, uh, dramatic changes in regulation seem to be ahead of us. Bailing out politically connected firms, uh, uh, somewhat politicizing the Fed, picking winners and losers among companies without consumers, without the market, without entrepreneurs deciding what those are. China is growing fast, and we need, in order to compete, we need to remember what it is brought us here. What I've tried to show tonight is that the status, when you take stock of America, we think the, the economic part is coming along. It's not a fabulous, it's not growing as fast as we'd like it to, but we think it's moving in the right direction. And when you take stock of the society and, a char and the character of the country, we think you'll find something pretty good. We've made unbelievable progress. But, you know, we didn't have a market to sell into like China did, and we didn't have anybody to finance our growth uh, like Japan did. We do believe our future has tremendous potential, but only if we as citizens continue hard work and have eternal vigilance about uh, so we don't get suffocated by 